All right. Uh, I'm going to share my screen to start off. Uh, can everybody see that? Yes. Yes. All right, good. Um, uh, Tom, Evie, uh, Tom, Evie, and I are going to uh, take you through some images this evening uh, to hopefully pick your interest in uh, Halt and Arp and his peculiar galaxies. And I think um, I would liken this to uh, a catalog of, of celestial objects that's similar to the Messier catalog in, in, in that uh, Arp started off to um, gener to do this catalog for a completely different reason than it exists today. Uh, today it's still around because people find it interesting to look at some of these uh, galaxies, uh, even though that's not what ARP's original intention was. So uh, bear with us this evening and we'll take you on a brief tour of uh, Mr. ARP and his galaxies. If I can get this to advance. Okay, uh, Halt and Arp uh, was born in 27. He died a few years ago in 2013 at the age of 86. Um, and he came of age during uh, what was really the golden age of cosmology, if you, if you think about it. It was uh, shortly after Edwin Hubble had uh, declared that there were other galaxies out there besides the one that we live in. And, uh, Arp got his Bachelor of Science from Harvard. He was born in New York and got his Bachelor of Science from Harvard in 49, and then moved on to Caltech where he earned his PhD in, in 1953. And uh, this was the same time that um, a lot of uh, new information was becoming available regarding the shape and, and evolution of galaxies. And it was also kind of the era of when big telescopes, especially the 200 inch tail, tail telescope uh, came online. And so Halt and Arp was kind of thrown right into the middle of all of that um, uh, with his work at Caltech. And he had basically did observational work. That is he took images himself, uh, both at Mount Wilson and more specifically at Mount Palomar where he spent uh, some 29 years collecting data. So um, all of that uh, work that he did uh, went into uh, what became the Atlas of Peculiar Galaxies. Uh, the Atlas itself was published uh, first in 1966, and it had a grand total of some 338 nearby galaxies. And as I already mentioned, um, these were photographed by Hale, by uh, Arp himself with the Hale 200 inch telescope or with the Ocean 48 Schmidt camera. And he, the picture there on the right shows Hale at the focus of the 200 inch telescope. Uh, and in this, gal this uh, atlas that he put together uh, was divided into groups based on the appearance. And that's kind of the, the key element here. Uh, there were a little over a hundred spirals, uh, quite a few ellipticals, a whole bunch of what were just described as galaxies. There were some double galaxies and then there were some that didn't fit into any other uh, category, which he termed miscellaneous. And in each of these groupings, uh, he, he defined specific characteristics uh, that he saw when, when he imaged these particular galaxies. And the third or the fourth bullet point there is probably uh, the most important. His intent was to uh, have a catalog or a, an atlas of different types of galaxies so that the cosmologists who were uh, popping up all over the place uh, could test various theories of galaxy evolution by looking at how these different, uh, what he called peculiar galaxies, 
uh, had evolved. And so that was uh, his intention in terms of putting together uh, this listing of 338 uh, different galaxies. He also used it as a reference for some later studies of what he called quasi-stellar objects. And today, the catalog is still uh, in use, mainly by uh, imagers, but it's recognized as a collection of interacting and merging galaxies. And it's kind of interesting because ARB had kind of the opposite um, assessment of the galaxies that he imaged. He was a strong believer in that uh, the galaxies were spawning uh, one another. And so that rather than these galaxies merging together or in, at least interacting, he felt that they were um, separating from each other in, in order to create new galaxies. So uh, he had a kind of a, a different approach to things and that got him into a bit of trouble. And so um, there were a whole bunch of controversies surrounding his work, uh, but I'll just list a few of them here before we actually look at some of the works. Um, about the time when he was doing his imaging in the 50s and the 60s uh, was when the first bevy of qua quasars were uh, identified. And the quasars were not well understood at this time, uh, particularly the fact uh, the red shifts that were measured for these uh, quasars. Um, and most astronomers um, came to feel that these were very luminous objects, but they were very far away. Uh, but Art wasn't of that opinion. Uh, what he observed was that a lot of these quasars uh, seemed to be where or near these peculiar galaxies that he had decided to put into his atlas. And by inference, he decided that they were somehow associated with these uh, galaxies, which he felt were uh, actively evolving. And he took on this theory, and this was despite uh, of the large differences in their redshift. So the galaxies that he was imaging, they were known to be fairly nearby, whereas the quasars that were being discovered uh, tended to be much far away, much further away, at least in terms of their measured redshifts. So his theory or his postulation was that the quasar redshifts weren't due to the Hubble expansion are due to their motion or their uh, distance, uh, but rather that they were somehow ejected from the active, nucle active galactic nuclei of these peculiar galaxies. And this theory um, became known as the non-cosmological uh, or intrinsic origin of quasars, which we now know is completely wrong. Uh, but back in the 60s, uh, there was still a lot of debate going on about this. And it wasn't until the late 1980s or even a little later than that, that most astronomers um, decided that this whole idea of quasars being somehow ejected from uh, active galactic nuclei was not really, uh, there really wasn't any evidence to support that. And it was probably a, a lot of hokum. And I noted uh, in reading up on Dr. Arp that he didn't believe in the Big Bang either. So he was kind of a controversial figure and I, he kind of held a lot of these uh, theories right up until, up until his death in, in 2013. Uh, and even wrote um, some papers and a book as late as the 1980s that uh, tried to um, defend what he thought was going on. So um, you probably have seen quite a few of uh, Arb's galaxies, and I'll show you just a couple. Um, you recognize, hopefully, you recognize this one. Uh, this is um, this is Arp eighty five, um, and uh, again, one that's uh, familiar to most of us. Another well known Arp is Arp one fifty two, and I'm sure if you think about uh, the most recently imaged black hole and the jet that comes from M87, you've probably heard of this one as well. And uh, ARP-168, uh, one of the companions of Andromeda. So uh, a lot of the 338 
uh, peculiar galaxies are ones that we're pretty familiar with, but we're, what we want to go over this evening is to show you some of the lesser known ones. And um, in order to do that, uh, we're going to take you further out. Um, and most of the most of the images that we're going to show you tonight are images of galaxies that are fairly small. Um, but because of the fact that we can image them with our modern equipment, and the fact that you can uh, enlarge the images enough to um, see de detail uh, that, that are recorded with the 200 inch Hale telescope um, makes it, it makes these uh, targets that are uh, ripe for picking by amateur astronomers. So uh, with that being said, I'm gonna turn the presentation over to my colleague, Tom Eby, and he's gonna take us through a bunch of uh, his own images uh, of various different ARPs and give us a taste for um, what uh, Halton ARP uh, was looking at when he put together his, his Atlas of Peculiar Galaxies. So if you're ready, Tom, you can uh, share your screen. All right, you can hear me okay, right? Yes. Get a little pointer in there. Okay, thanks, Greg, for that, that thorough introduction. It's a very interesting topic. And uh, I don't know if you mentioned it, but the uh, publication, the Sky uh, Publishing, is, is available again. Uh, you alerted me to that about seven weeks ago and it's about forty dollars and it's it's really a great reference book uh, that covers all of that uh, objects <clears throat> it's great not only for imaging uh, people but also for visual tom, observers tom apparently some folks are having difficulty hearing you if you could maybe turn up your mic a bit oh sorry about that uh let's see Can you hear me okay now? That's better. That's better. It's a little better? Yeah. Okay, I might have, I might have had a bad connection. Uh, anyway, um, uh, the, the publication from Sky uh, Publishing is available now for about $40. It's well worth it. It's a great uh, compendium of the history that Greg described, uh, the 20th century controversies that are was engaged in uh, very interesting reading, and also the uh, uh, rivalries and uh, all sorts of crazy issues that, that resulted from it. Um, so it's, it's, it's well worth uh, the investment in the book, uh, even if you're not so much interested in uh, galaxy structures or even the history of modern cosmology development in the 20th century impressions. Uh, the images I'm going to show. Taken with a, as I say here, a mix or match of various pieces of equipment. Uh, I'm not going to put each telescope and all, and all that stuff, all that detail in each slide. So I just wanted to put it all into this one slide. Uh, so following images were taken with some combination. These different telescopes mounts that I can't. Uh, the first object I'm going to mention is ARP 105. Uh, it's a member of the Abel 1185 galaxy cluster. There's some major centered about 400 million. There's about 85 members in this cluster. Uh, the ARP object, it's this zoom way over to the left here, this long elongated object. <clears throat> So in the next slide, a little more detail. And this is the format I'm going to use for the slides. Basically, what I have here is the, uh, the image on the left, the inverted image that uh, not only ARP itself, but with the talent, the inverted image. So, and then I pulled out an uh, inverted image of my own from, from a photograph I took. Then if I have it, also the color is on the right side. 
So this particular object, R105, is known as the car for its obvious shape. Uh, and ARP's classification of, of it was uh, elliptical connected to the spiral. Uh, ARP had its own classification scheme set up somewhere for the Hubble galaxy morphology classification set up. Um, so uh, it's, a, it's a basically a tree of different uh, descriptions. Uh, the different objects were placed in different slots on the tree. So this one happens to be in the elliptical connected to spiral uh, category uh, in the larger grouping called elliptical and elliptical like galaxy. So this particular one uh, contains some interesting features. The blue arrow up here shows what's called the Embartsinian dot, the magnitude 18 uh, dwarf galaxy, presumably pulled out by tidal forces from main galaxy up here, which is connected to all sorts of different chaotic structures and other galaxies down here at the bottom. And the red arrow points to a quasar. This is a 20th magnitude quasar. Uh, it's a radioactive uh, quasar. It's a emissive radio frequency. And this is one of those quasars that Craig mentioned with our his own views on it, actually uh, potentially originating from the core of being ejected from uh, the nucleus of the galaxy rather than being a uh, distant street object of five to ten billion years. Um, this particular object, R105, I think is about 385 million years out. So obviously it's quite a bit closer than we think most quasars are. But they're lying out there in billions of light years, but uh, are postulated, as, as Greg described, that these, these quasars were actually intrinsically or chemically or physically uh, producing the redshift that other astronomers eventually interpreted as due to the uh, high recession. And one of the uh, points of these different uh, ARP objects is that most of them are small. There's a few large ones, which are very well known galaxies, but uh, most of them are in the uh, few minute, uh, arc minutes size range, uh, generally in the one to two arc minutes size range, which is actually a little bit bigger at about five. So these are not objects that you're going to go after with small refractors, generally, or if you're looking at catching images of uh, colorful vast distance, uh, these probably aren't your cup of tea. But if you're interested in cosmological uh, aspects of astronomy and trying to capture high resolution of some of these structures, which a few years ago were uh, tough to get even with much larger telescopes than we have today, uh, or even here like the Palomar 200 in which we expect this out in films, uh, I think it points out that yeah, that is the advanced technology today available. Very reasonable cost to, uh, to all of us. Uh, the next one is ARP 112. This is a 14th magnitude object, uh, also known as NGC 7805. It's in the category of uh, elliptical and elliptical light galaxies. And ARP's description of it was that it was an elliptical repelling spiral arms. Some of these descriptions are a little bit cryptic. It's not always entirely clear what the description exactly refers to in each image. Um, so there's a little interpretation you've got to do when you read the uh, description to try to compare the uh, description with the uh, yeah. uh, But it, I believe that uh, this galaxy here uh, is probably the elliptical light galaxy, which is having a repellent effect on these other two galaxies, maybe pushing this arm away, possibly pushing this galaxy away as well, uh, seems to be a reason for interpretation. Uh, ARP 89, um, 
this object is in the category of spiral with large high surface price brightness companion on the arm. And this is a fairly broad category. There's actually quite a few galaxies out there that seem to have uh, smaller galaxies, uh, the light small ones hanging off the edge of one of the arm. It's a good example of that. And in Arp's notes, he describes it as uh, absorption waves in the companion and the diffuse arm beyond the companion. So the diffuse arm is apparently coming from the main galaxy, which is um, the arm extends past the companion to the southern direction. This image, by the way, was taken with a, an S big SD10 I said in the bottom of CCD. It's probably from 10 years ago. Uh, Arc 65. Uh, is in the category of canyons on arms again. Um, his description is that uh, canyons lie off the projected ends of both spiral arms. So off this spiral here, we have two little two little blobs of uh, canyon galaxies. Now I wasn't able to determine yet whether those galaxies have the same redshift or nearly the same redshift as the main spiral. Have to look into that yet. So I'm not sure if these are uh, physically connected in some way to the main spiral, or if they just happen to be line of sight objects. But that was that's one of the issues again with quasars and, and galaxies and their interpretation of things. Most people thought that what he was interpreting is quasars that uh, being ejected or associated with nuclei of galaxies. Are in fact, uh, at great distances, uh, we didn't believe so, but uh, conventional astronomy in the world did. So uh, whether whether these are actually part of this spiral, well, who knows? But, uh, if the redshift is the same, that would imply that they are associated. If the redshift is very different, they you know they're way further away. Uh, unless there's a chemical or physical process that uh, accounts for the equivalent of that. Now, this is ARP 84. Uh, ARP, I couldn't find any notes from ARP on this one. There's no description. Uh, NGC 5394 and 5 is only the Heron. Uh, now, I did check. The redshifts on these, and these do have virtually identical redshifts. So presumably they are physically attached, which is interesting because you wonder what sort of process is occurring there, whether these are two discrete galaxies that are approaching one another, uh, haven't really interacted too much yet, or what else might be going Because there doesn't seem to be a lot of disturbance going on in the main, uh, main spiral. Ninety-five. Yet the uh, extremely close proximity with the pair of galaxies. Uh, Arc two eighty-six, also known as NGC fifty-five sixty-six, falls under the category of double galaxies with infall and attraction. So you're free to interpret that however you like. Um, I assume infall means that they're coming together, uh, all three of them together. Uh, and I would think that is another way of saying attraction. So infall and attraction are the same thing. Harp does mention that uh, there, there's no connection visible in the on the Palmer plate here, you really don't see a ridging directly connected. But again, these are all at pretty much the same redshifts, so you would think that they would start to interact at some point. And if there isn't any obvious visual evidence of it. Uh, 
this is one of the smaller categories, ARP 173, category of narrow counter tails. Um, these are quite faint. These are 15, a little fainter than 15 magnitude. Um, they're about half an arc in size, so they're pretty darn small. You have to take a pretty long exposure to pick up this faint counter tail. In this particular image, I was surveying it. I happened to pick up on this other guy. See, so it's uh, five billion meters, magnitude twenty-one point two, which is pretty close to the limit of what you can do with a eleven inch telescope. So it's an interesting pair there. Um, you always look for connections between members of these groups catalog and it's tough to see uh, with really strong uh, photographic or computer enhancement sometimes you can create what looks like uh, connections or bridges sometimes those are overlaps of light uh, curves from the individuals and basically an artifact so there's still a lot of these objects that are not entirely resolved in terms of their physical interaction. I think if you look on the inverted image here, you can see a little bit of dark in between uh, the two galaxies there. So there may be a connection. You can see it maybe even a little better over here. Uh, ARP 273, um, this is one defined as double galaxies with connected arms. Uh, the main uh, spiral here described as bright, long, well-defined arms, but smooth and not patchy. So the spiral arms on this, this thing are generally pretty, they're not clumpy, modeled, or broken up. There appear to be a lot of hydrogen alpha region, clusters and things like that going on. They're fairly smooth, actually. Good spiral. Here, uh, if you photograph the uh, Hercules cluster, it's April 2151. It's part of the Hercules supercluster, about 500 million light years away. Uh, then you've automatically captured at least three ARPs in one shot. Uh, image on the left here is taken with the uh, Richard Pachane telescope. Um, and I've circled here a couple of ARPs, terrible one here. Uh, ARP 71 is the spiral with the small high surface brightness depending on the arm. Uh, ARP 272 described as galaxies with connected arms. That's this one. I believe that's uh, NGC 6050. And the yellowish spiral and a bluish spiral. Okay. And also ARP 172, lower left, uh, described as. Uh, Interacting galaxy from the piece coated tails. Large down here in the lower right. And it's an interesting structure because it's, it's like two large fan shaped uh, galaxies that, that seem to be repelling each other as much as they are possibly attracting. So it makes for an interesting variety of uh, galaxy morphologies, visible and Uh, ARP 166, I don't have any special notes on this one. Uh, galaxies with diffuse filaments uh, with small spiral at end of plume. So there appears to be two ellipticals here kind of merged together into one giant blob in the Palomar plate. Uh, but emanating out of this uh, apparent collision. Is a plume of material, and at the end is this small spiral that I refers to. I did check that in Aladdin, but it's at 1.4 billion light years distance, so it's quite a bit further away uh, than the main pair here. If you assume ARP is wrong, it makes for it field. Of course, there's several other galaxies.
<clears throat> most of you have taken pictures for a while and probably photographed this at least several times, our 316 or 44 up in Leo in the category uh, called groups of galaxies. And ARP describes it in this catalog as having signs of interaction. I think primarily the interaction referred to is NGC 3187. That's this spiral that just spun off, spiral arm that's going to be spun off. Opposite direction to 180 degrees, but presumably from the passing, possibly one of these ellipticals. Uh, there is some distortion in the 3190 here as well. It's not entirely intuitively clear what. From. But since there's quite a few galaxies uh, crowded into a small volume of space, uh, it's likely that uh, these three may really have interacted pretty substantially. And generally, when you have interaction, you don't have a lot of distortion appearing in the ellipticals. Um, they're pretty dense, you have a strong gravitational field, and they do most of the damage on the spirals. But the spirals don't do it themselves. Um, so that makes for a pretty field. It's uh, very visible in a, a six or an eight inch scope. You don't need a, a large scope to get a nice deep uh, picture of that. This, this inverted image here was taken with a C10X CCD camera and uh, eight inch uh, detection scope. Uh, this one you probably photographed as well multiple times, if not observed. It's M60, big elliptical up in Virgo, uh, ARP 116, and its companion with NGC 4647 falls under the category of elliptical and elliptical like galaxy. Once again. Uh, obviously, the elliptical is M60, the spiral is NGC 4647. Elliptical close to and perturbing spirals is the ARP's verbatim description of it. Uh, so I pulled out a close up of the spiral. Uh, and it looks to me anyway like the uh, spiral may be uh, possibly distorted. Uh, maybe the core of it is being attracted toward, uh, toward M60 down here in the lower left. That seems to be possible. There's also a pretty distinctive absorption arc here in, in the spiral around cut. So it's, I think there was a uh, supernova also, we we'll have to go back and check, but I think last year, so there was a supernova in the scouts. That I recall. That photo was that too. So I have to double check that. Yeah. Pretty interesting. It was really quite a blue galaxy. See the color that uh, The next one, ARP 184. Uh, this galaxy is also in a much larger crowded field of neighboring galaxies. I didn't publish here the entire field. It's really a complex field full of, of deep shapes and sizes of other galaxies. I didn't pull this one out. Uh, it's described again as. Uh, galaxies with narrow filaments in the arc catalog uh, with two long straight arms or filaments. And at first blush, I thought that, that maybe these two main arms uh, spiral uh, are referring to. But in fact, I think if you look at the Palomar plate very closely, you see very faint a spindle or needle of light here. Another one here. I think that is what the uh, what ARP was referring to described it as two long straight arms. But it's a pretty galaxy too, lots of uh, detail in it. It's an interesting structure. It's a little bit strange shape for a spiral. It almost looks like it's been compressed or distorted somehow, and then these two arms spun off. So apparently it's undergone some sort of gravitational perturbation in the past. ARP 288, uh, I think, is an interesting one. It's um, in the category of double galaxies, subcategory of wind effects. 
And since we know there aren't really any forms of wind in outer space except for the particles and electromagnetic radiation, I presume uh, the effects that he's talking about are due to that uh, rather than gravitation. Not entirely clear, but uh, he did put it in a different category. So he describes it as having streamers in both directions, the edge of the spiral. This ball up here. These are very faint. Yeah, this is about a three and a half hour exposure, but it took quite a bit of time to pull those out. And down here, this elliptical is interesting. There's a couple of spirals and banging into that one. And, uh, yet you don't see a whole lot of uh, distortion or streamers or stars or anything coming off. Do a little bit unusually. Maybe you expect to see some more disturbance going on. And then this spiral here is, uh, is far enough away from these, I guess, to not be too much affected by activity that's going on here. But clearly, this spiral is, has seen, uh, seen some trouble in the past. Uh, this one, I think it, uh, I photographed that a couple of months, two weeks ago. So this is ARP 25. This is in ARP. 114. This is one of the more or less unusual cases where there's two ARPs, like an ARP within an ARP. So ARP 114 is the, is the pair of the ISs. And uh, 57.6 here is the one that's described as having heavy arm. And ARP also described it as having a tubular arm, straight at first and bent. And that appears to be this arm here. It's coming down straight and bends into the nucleus. That's part of the arrow up here. That's something of an unusual piece. And there's other straight features over here on this side. So it's clear, fairly some interesting things going on there. There's an asymmetry going on with this galaxy too. The, the spiral structure is pretty splayed open on this left side pretty condensed in the right. So that appears to be uh, due to gravitational pull, perhaps, from, from the, the bigger left of the elliptical close by. Uh, this one I did just a few days ago, actually. It's our 214, uh, 322. In the category of irregularities, absorption, and resolution. Um, not clear exactly what absorption and resolution refer to here, but that's the description of the category. Now, ARP 214 is the main spiral here, and it has a narrow absorption lanes lane to the center. So it's it's a barred spiral, uh, but rather than that bar being comprised of stars, as it is in most barred spirals, it's comprised of Sort of material of dust, give it that, that yellow color. That's a little bit, and there's a fair amount of disturbed material coming out the polar ends of, of the spiral. And as well, you see a kind of a up the rim shape along the periphery of the main body. It's a little bit interesting. Down below is the group. Uh, and 56, as I recall. This is about 380 million light years off in the distance. Um, the main pair of galaxies here is about 58 million light years distance. So these are way off the far blue reaches. And these are about, as I recall, 15, 14 to 15 magnitudes. Pretty faint. Uh, they're apparently undergoing some of their own interactions, which gave them uh, their own art designation. An interesting juxtaposition of the near and far, uh, the two arts in the field. Now, this particular field is not uh, 
described as a double arc. The 14 and 322, even though they're in the same field. So, yeah, it doesn't always seem to be uh, a lot of consistency in some of the things in the art catalog in terms of how things are categorized. A lot of it is described as being descriptive uh, more than literal. So, it makes for interesting reading and uh, opens the door to a lot of your own interpretive skills and abilities uh, when you read about how they're described versus what you see inspecting them, interpreting them. And that's, that's it. Uh, a lot more, but you don't have all night. <laughs> so, all right. Hopefully that gives you some diversity of uh, diversity of morphologies, as they say, in our world. Well, that's it. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Tom. I think uh, I think um, we'll go back, and I've got just a few of my own to uh, to share. Tom, you need to uh, stop your screen sharing. Yeah. There we go. Okay, I, um, I just had a few uh, additional ones to, um, to show. I have to wait for it to advance here. Um, this is a, a, a kind of interesting one. This is a ARC uh, 77, um, which consists of NGC 1097 uh, in the constellation of Farnax. And it, this is again one that ARP described as a spiral with a small high surface brightness companion on the arm. And um, he also noted that there were um, uh, jets. Um, visible. Uh, and those aren't visible on my image, except very faintly when the image is stretched here, you can see um, these very faint jets, which are about 20th magnitude. Uh, there are actually four with two on one side and two on the other, and I couldn't detect the other ones, uh, but you can see some faint uh, uh, representation of them here on the highly stretched image. And the the uh, thing that's odd about this is that most of the time these jets of uh, material from these galaxies is, are made up of plasma, um, but these jets appear to be actually made up of stars. And so uh, this makes it a little bit different than uh, some of the other galaxies that are in, in an ARPS catalog. Um, ARP 99 um, is the uh, NGC 7550 group in Pegasus, uh, and you may have seen these before, uh, but again, the, uh, the main uh, interacting galaxies are the two at the bottom here, NGC 7550 and 7547, with some obvious uh, material or tidal tails being exchanged uh, between them. And apparently the galaxy at the top, which is 7549, uh, isn't associated with the uh, the two lower ones, which are actually making up ARC-99. Another interesting one is ARC-104, uh, which is 
consists of uh, NGC 5216 and 5218. 5218 is the galaxy at the top and 5216 uh, below it. And the uh, interesting thing here, in addition to the uh, tidal tails, it seems to be connecting the two is that uh, each of the galaxies apparently has its own wisps of ejected material um, associated with it. And so uh, the way ARP described these was elliptical connected to spiral. And I'm assuming that the spiral is 5218 above and uh, that this one looked at, at like an elliptical on his original image. You probably are well familiar with uh, ARP 120, uh, NGC 4435 and 4438. Uh, 4438, the one at the bottom, and 4435 up above. Um, these are in Markarian's chain in Virgo, um, sometimes described as the eyes or Copeland's eyes after uh, Leland Copeland, who was uh, editor of uh, one of the uh, image editors for Sky and Telescope back in the early 50s. And he gave a lot of different names to different uh, targets. Uh, and some of those stuck, and one of them is Copeland's eyes. Uh, again, these uh, appearing to, to visual observers as a pair of eyes. Um, Arp described them as ellipticals close to and disturbing spirals. And there's a couple of interesting features here. One is the wishbone, uh, which is pretty obvious on most images. You can see it here. And the other is um, uh, what are described as absorption characteristics. And what he was usually referring to when he used that terminology, and I think Tom uh, explained uh, or showed some of it in a couple of his images, when ARP called these absorption uh, features, it's what we now recognize as dust and particulate matter that block out the uh, underlying parts of the galaxy. And so um, there's a lot of these in the peculiar uh, galaxies that, that are uh, described. ARP 175 consists of three galaxies, IC 3481 and 3481A, uh, which are these two up here, which apparently have an obvious tidal tail connecting the two of them. But in addition, there's a long tidal tail that connects them uh, apparently to uh, 3483 below this bright star. And so um, again, the, um, uh, the distinctive feature here is the interaction uh, that, that ARP uh, picked up uh, among these three galaxies. This is uh, one of the few uh, where there are actually three galaxies that are pretty far separated apart uh, across the sky that do have some uh, apparent connection. And last but not least, ARP 189, which you probably have seen before, NGC 4651, um, is kind of an unusual one because it's like one of the solitary galaxies uh, that doesn't have any other apparent galaxies interacting with it, but it does seem to um, show uh, evidence of some past interaction. Um, and that's uh, evident from the a uh, tidal tail which extends out to the west, I'm sorry, to the east uh, from the main galaxy and then has a counterposing tidal tail, um, both of which uh, are described as narrow filaments. So I think you can see from the images that Tom shared and from these few that I've shared with you that um, these really are a catalog of peculiar galaxies and that they are uh, targets that you can reach with a um, with an amateur telescope. It doesn't have to be a large telescope uh, or a tremendously good camera. The uh, here are some ARP references if you want to follow up further. Um, the first one is Halt and ARP's actual website. The second one uh, is the paper that a lot of the images that Tom showed you came from. Uh, if you do look up the original paper. Uh, you should note that the first 60 or so pages of the paper are just the images and all the details are at the very end. So you have to kind of go to the end of the paper 
to see what he actually said about each of the individual images. There is a Wikipedia entry for, for ARP. And as Tom uh, mentioned, um, the book, The ARP Atlas of Peculiar Galaxies, a Chronicle and Observer's Guide, uh, was published by Wilhelm and Bell back in 2006. And then Wilhelm and Bell kind of went out of business, but a couple of years ago, they were bought by Sky and Telescope, who was then bought by the American Astronomical Society. And um, so Wilhelm and Bell kind of came back to life. Um, and you can get this uh, book in hard copy, hardcover uh, for $40.95. And I think I paid $35 for it back in 2006. But uh, it's a great uh, observer's handbook, whether you're observing uh, visually to try and find some of these um, peculiar galaxies or whether you want to image them. And so uh, I'll stop uh, here. And if we have any questions, Tom or I would be willing to try to answer them. No questions. Okay. I'm sure you've seen enough peculiar galaxies for one evening. Um, a couple of things related to our group. Um, I've been asked by a couple of different members uh, about the possibility of having a face-to-face -face meeting uh, going back to what we did before uh, the pandemic and before we switched over to Zoom. And we took a informal poll uh, last fall um, and most folks indicated that they were happy with Zoom because it allowed folks to participate even if they weren't in Tucson or uh, from the uh, comfort of their own home. But um, there is some benefit to meeting face to face. So um, if anyone has any comments or questions, uh, suggestions, um, feel free to share those. Greg, I think I might have been one of the people who suggested the face to face meeting. Um, and it, it wouldn't be my intent to undercut these meetings at all. Um, I would love to meet as many of you as possible in person someday. And whether it's just getting together uh, at, at a restaurant or a bar someplace or, or in a field with telescopes or whatever it might be, I would, I would just welcome the chance to, to meet some of you. Great. Any other questions or comments? Something like this could be set up at CAT. We could probably pick a weekend that was not the quote unquote absolute best imaging weekend, but uh, we could use CAC facility and get together there and actually have all of the access to pads and electrical stuff, what, whatever we need to, if we wanted to do imaging as well as just sitting down and talking. There's a big conference room there at CAC and uh, all of those things could be accomplished in one location. That's a good, good thought. I was also thinking that um, since we have the monsoons during the summer, it might be easy for us to just get together, as Jeff suggested, at some uh, local area uh, where it wouldn't involve observing, but we could get together and share a beer or a hot dog or something and uh, just get to meet each other. Um, but the idea of, of going and doing observing, I think, is a good idea as well. Any other suggestions? I can host a barbecue, provided somebody can help me culminate my uh, hyperstar. <laughs> Wait a minute. I think you've got an ulterior motive there. Yeah. <laughs> Actually, Portillo's just opened up. So that might, I know that when I was in Illinois with Portillo's, uh, have, have you ever been to Portillo's? Any of you familiar with Portillo's hot dogs? Italian beef, great. Well, they yeah. usually have rooms set up that you can arrange. They're like private rooms. I mean, the place is kind of noisy, but you can get like a separate area. If I'm assuming they have those set up as well, most of them do. And then you could just reserve something and then experience some Chicago style hot dogs or Italian beef as well. Good. I would encourage, uh, would ask those of you who have these specific suggestions to please uh, email me directly um, um, to so I don't lose track of them. 
And then uh, maybe I'll put up a poll or something. And we can kind of decide on what's the way most folks want to go. The, um, the reason I've stayed away from trying to do a hybrid meeting is that the uh, TAAA has done that for the last several months. And it's been kind of cumbersome. And, and there have been a few problems with uh, combining uh, an in-person meeting and a, and a Zoom meeting at the same time. Not to say that it can't be done. Uh, but it, it, it's uh, somewhat difficult to pull off, at least based on uh, what I've seen from the, the issues that have come up with them. So um, we'll keep all of these different suggestions in mind and, and I'll get the group to kind of vote on what uh, we think the best way to go. Um, again, as I mentioned uh, last month, if you have topics that you think you'd like to hear about or that you'd be willing to lead a discussion on, please send those along to me. We're always looking for topics for future meetings. Um, and uh, last but not least, um, I know a lot of you have given me permission to use your images for the uh, Desert Sky Bulletin. Um, and if you uh, do that, um, I, I keep those images and try to uh, use them in, uh, or submit them to uh, David Rossiter so he can include them in the bulletin. One thing that's come up recently is a lot of folks use Astrobin uh, to share their images. And sometimes the images on Astrobin can't be easily copied. And I, I think that that's an Astrobin feature. Um, and so if you want to uh, share your image uh, to allow me to use it on the Desert Sky Bulletin, you need to send me a copy of it or, or turn off the um, the non-sharing feature on Astrobin so that I can grab a copy of it uh, in, in its best resolution. If you send it directly to me, um, try to reduce it down to 10 megabytes or less so that it doesn't uh, overwhelm the uh, the Desert Sky Bulletin. But again, uh, if you use Astrobin, you can leave your full resolution image there and send me a lower resolution. And I usually try to include the link so that folks that see the uh, your image on the bulletin can then go and look at the uh, full image with all the details uh, on Astrobin or your private website, wherever. Any questions about that? Yeah, it's uh, just one. Uh, I was under the impression that uh, by giving permission to, to use our stuff there, that if we published it uh, on uh, to the group, you know, on Gmail, that you could then use that. Would you need to do something else besides just publish? No, I, no, as long as you tell me at some point in time that it's okay to use your images, uh, then I'll remember who you are. And, and I'll, yeah. every time you submit an image, I put it in my special image folder uh, for use in a future bulletin. So that that's, that's perfectly fine. Okay. Yeah, that's because I just assumed that all right. If you saw something you'd like to take it. So. Yeah, if you if you publish it uh, to the group and you've told me that it's okay to use your images, mm -hmm. and then I usually grab those images and keep them for, for future reference. So expect to see your image on the bulletin at some point in the future. Okay. I can't use all the images, but I try to use uh, a selection from as many folks as possible. All right. And I'm not comes. sure who was asking about uh, hyperstar collimation. Oh yeah, that was me. I found this device on the web place. It's a 3D printed uh, thing you stick on the at the, at the uh, uh, corrector plate in the front on mm -hmm. when you put your hyperstar in place. What it basically does, it gives you three lines. Mm -hmm. And it makes a Y pattern, Dave. Yeah. And the whole idea is when you get the hyperstar collimated, the lines will meet in the center. So uh, I haven't tried it yet. And I don't remember the manufacturer. Yeah, I was at Star Arizona on Saturday for their stargazing primarily just to because I'm brand new to this. I just got the equipment in December and you know, they put the hyperstar on, but the only thing they couldn't do in the store to set things up was to collimate the hyperstar. Hyper so, um, and I've never bothered with it, 
But then when I was there Saturday, Dean from Star Arizona checked it out and said, you know, your screws are loose on your Hyperstar. <laughs> so he tightened down the screws. They were loose. Uh -huh. um, and I, I'm totally ignorant about this stuff. I'm still new to it. Um, and then uh, one of the other guys that works there, Uray, I believe his name is, he went and checked it out. He said, you know, we're so close. He pointed it straight up and uh, towards the zenith. And he looked at it. And he says, you're so close right now. It gets to be like a tug of war trying to get this thing perfect. So the past images that I've done, I noticed actually um, Russell Cronin, who, you know, makes Star Exterminator. I was emailing him the other day. He says, yeah, you got to culmination issue with some of these images when i use star exterminator it would leave some remnants so um but since some worked fine and i think it was just because of the way maybe the scope was pointing so i'm not sure whether i have a problem yet or not until i can actually go out and do some more imaging and once i do that um that might be of interest to me but i know that uh, what they were doing they were putting their hand over one side of it to see where you know where things were at to, to try to work around and that might be a good good tool to use. Yeah, yeah I, have, I have one of those devices, Tom. And um, I'll, I'll tell you that the um, the three lines are very small. So if you're doing it with a camera, um, you need to enlarge the image on your screen. If you're doing it visually, uh, you need to use a Barlow or something to get to get it big enough so that you can easily see it. And you, and you need a pretty bright star uh, in order to get it uh, so that you can actually see those lines. Mm. I, I kind of thought that they would be real big and easy to see, but they tend to be, they tend to be very small. So you have to look really carefully as you're making the adjustments. Yep. David, uh, I've, I've uh, uh, collimated my C11 Hyperstar several times, and I could probably talk you through the basics of it. You just need to get over being afraid of it is the biggest yeah. thing. Uh, but it's it's basically you saw what they're doing at Star Arizona. You're, you're pointing it straight up, and then you're adjusting each adjuster. Right. I, once you get it set, uh, before I ever take the camera off or, or do anything to it, I just make sure everything is snug down. Mm -hmm. Because if they do loosen up, then you've got a problem. And if they're yep. loose, then if you're pointing, you know, different, the gravity is going to make that thing sag if they're loose. And yeah. that probably gets your comment that sometimes, you know, certain images have an issue and others don't, depending yeah. on where you're pointed. But uh, it it's not that hard to do. And I, I just do it visually. I'm using an ASI Air, so I have an iPad right yeah, there by well. me. And just so spreading your two fingers will get that big enough on your star. And the other thing, you need to frequently recenter the star because as you make adjustments, it's going to change where the center is. Right. Uh, but anyway, it's the sort of thing, once you've done it a few times, uh, it's just not that hard. And then if you make, make sure things stay snug, it's not going to get off. You know, I, got, I got a feeling that it was because my screws were loose the whole time yep. I've been using the thing over the past few months. And yep. and then when yep. when uh, after Dean did that and then Uriah came out and checked it out, he said, oh, we're, you know, we're so close. We could spend hours here trying to get it perfect. So I said, OK, we'll just leave it. But then it got so windy, <laughs> I couldn't image. And then, you know, you find these little things out like I got a special 12 volt cable because I got a splitter for my Jackery battery. And I figure I've got a really nice heavy duty cable for the ASI Air. Uh, wrong. I found out that because the cable was so heavy, it would kind of disconnect from the power. And all of a sudden, my Wi Fi went down. I thought it was Wi Fi, it was the power. So Dean gave me an extension to it that's lighter weight that has enough length. So that doesn't happen. So at that point, I just gave up and didn't do any imaging. So, but uh, well, next time when we can do imaging again, I will check it out. It may not be a problem. Well, I'd be able to, I'd be glad to get with you offline and help you any way I can. I, I appreciate it, Randy. I really do. Yeah, cable manage, management is always one of the things that you learn as you go. It's all these minute details that I'm learning now. <laughs> all right. Well, thank you, everyone, for um, participating. And uh, I'll try to 
uh, post the recording of this and any other additional materials as soon as possible. Thank you all. Thank you, Greg. Thank you, Tom. Thanks for being here tonight. Yeah.